Hi, uh, I'm Dieter Zube. I'm an aerospace engineer working in the field of satellite spacecraft propulsion, and I'm here today to answer seven of your questions from the field of spacecraft propulsion and uh, rocket science. Question one from username medium well, and the question is, if space is a vacuum, how can rockets work? What are thrusters pushing against if there's nothing out there? That is a question that comes up regular on a regular basis on the principle of space flight, the principle of rockets. If you have a rocket engine, you've got the combustion in the combustion chamber that's creating the hot gas, and the hot gas is then going to push the exhaust into the other direction, downstream of the nozzle. And imagine you're sitting in a boat on a lake, and you have a big heap of baseballs with you, and you pick up a baseball and throw it away with, from you. And every time that you're going to throw one of those baseballs, you're going to feel a force pushing on your shoulder, and because you're sitting in that boat, that boat will make a little step in the other direction. You're throwing the baseball away from you, the boat moves in the other direction. That's what, hap what happens to your spacecraft. The rocket engine pushes hot gas, the exhaust, away from the engine, and the recoil of that is going to move the rocket engine in the opposite direction. And because you're not just throwing individual baseballs one of the other, but you're continuously producing thrust with your rocket engine, you're moving continuously in the other direction with your rocket. Question two. We've got a question from Maskenried TV, and uh, the question is, why do rockets not tip over when all the thrust is at the bottom? And I've got a rocket here with me, and uh, this is a good, nice example to demonstrate that. Imagine you're balancing a pencil on your fingertips, and that's what the engines have to do. The rocket engines can actually gimbal, which means that you can move them around so that if the rocket will tip in one direction, you're going to very quickly point the rockets in such a way that it's going to counteract that tipping rocket. And that way is how you're going to keep it steady and how you're going to keep it on its trajectory when it's going to be launched. Another way that you can do that is that if you need so much control of your rocket that you can't gimbal the engines enough, you may have small engines up high on the rocket that will help you to counteract that, to keep the rocket going in the direction that you want it to go. Question three, from username Ida Brones. Why do rockets have to hit the atmosphere at an angle on re-entry to not burn up? Very good question, because uh, you ha will have always wondered, probably when the uh, astronauts or unmanned spacecraft come back from orbit, they are, uh, may have to make certain that the spacecraft, when it re-enters atmosphere, is not coming in too flat. So if this is the atmosphere, the spacecraft would bounce off the atmosphere. If it's coming in too steep, the spacecraft would come in too fast. The heat that's going to be created is going to be too high, and the spacecraft is going to burn up in the atmosphere. So somewhere in the middle of that is a sweet spot, and that's the one that the, the spacecraft have to hit. And in this case of the Apollo capsule, uh, they had a relatively narrow corridor, so they had to come in on a corridor that was only about two to three degrees wide. If, it, if they would have been too high, they would have skipped off. If it would have been too low, they would have burned up. Because, again, you're coming in so high, so fast, you're dissipating that kinetic energy you're converting that kinetic energy into thermal energy, you're going to heat it up, you're going to experience such high temperatures that virtually all metals, if you would expose them directly to that temperature, would start melting. So you have to design the spacecraft and you have to select that re-entry in such a way that you're going to keep the temperatures manageable. You're not going to avoid the high temperatures, but you're going to keep them in such a way that 
the spacecraft then in the 10 minutes that it takes from re-entry to landing does not overheat and, and maintains decent temperatures, for example, for the astronauts on your spacecraft. Question four. This question is from user lines. Why were the space shuttles retired? Would the tech have evolved to make them more effective and efficient? Why was the return to rockets? Are these as reusable? Thanks. Well, that's a very good question relating to the history of uh, spacecraft and the, the space shuttle having flown for NASA from 1981 through 2011 with 135 flights. And a lot of people, including myself, who worked in this area, come up with that question. Why did NASA decide to retire them? The space shuttle was a very useful tool and had a lot of capabilities. The payloads, the size of satellites that could be launched with it is unsurpassed. And even today, we have not reached that level again. And so the decision that NASA made to retire the space shuttle has to be seen under two aspects. So one was by that time, the space shuttle, when the, when the space shuttle were retired in 2011, by that time, the technology for the space shuttle was more than 45 years old. The space shuttle was first conceived, designed in the 1970s, and that last flight was more than 30 years after its first flight, and the technology was very old. The second aspect was the uh, quite high cost. Today, we think of the space shuttle as a reusable spacecraft, but nothing really was reusable on that one, in all honesty. When the space shuttle was conceived, when that idea first came up, there was the idea that one shuttle would be flown every four weeks. So between four shuttles, this, the idea had been that you would launch a shuttle every week. And in all honesty, NASA only got to as much as four to five flights every year in the end. And each flight for the shuttle, depending on how you calculate cost and, and what, did, what you included and what you didn't include, but was somewhere between 500 million and 1.5 billion US dollars for each flight. And so as a result, the shuttle was essentially too expensive to continue to operate. Question five from user Owen Banana Man, and Owen asks, why are rockets spacecraft corrosion resistant if there's no oxygen in space? Very good question, and to answer that, I have to talk a little bit about what we engineers call the life cycle of a product. So let's pretend you're building a satellite, and when you're building that satellite, you have to make certain that your satellite can withstand all the conditions that it's going to see throughout its life. In this case, the satellite will be built in a laboratory on the ground in workshops, and then it will be transported, for example, to the launch site in Florida for weeks at a time, sometimes months if there are some delays. The spacecraft will be sitting in very humid air, so you need to design it in such a way that your spacecraft can tolerate those conditions. And then once you're in space, space is not an absolute a perfect vacuum. For example, in the altitudes in which the International Space Station is flying, there is still enough what is called the rest atmosphere, enough gases that are highly corrosive. So because of that, you have to select materials, you have to select uh, metals for the design of your spacecraft that are corrosion resistant. And that is one of the tasks that engineers have to do. They have to be uh, very selective on which materials to use where so that you don't run into problems during the whole life of that spacecraft from design, from production, through launch, through the use in space, and eventually even then at the time when the spacecraft is uh, going to be deorbited at the end of its life and you take it back down from its orbit. Question six, so how do I become a rocket scientist? So typically what we refer to as rocket scientists are usually engineers in the aerospace industry. 
The aerospace industry needs engineers in virtually all areas, and there's no one field of rocket science. I'm a satellite propulsion engineer, but in the company for which I work, we have many different engineers. We have engineers that are experts in material science. We have experts that are working in thermal and structural analysis. And that's what you would decide when you go to college, where you then decide what you are good at. Because when you decide, when you select a field that you're good at, it's much more likely that you're going to get one of those jobs that you're going to like. When you're still in high school, uh, there are already some programs available in uh, different places. In these programs for science, technology, engineering, math, those STEM programs, where you can already get the information, get the knowledge that you may eventually need as an engineer student in college at the university. And for example, here at the Museum of Flight, we have the Washington Aerospace Scholar Program, the WASP program every year. And with that experience then, you will be in a better position to find that job that you're dreaming of, that you think of when you talk, how do you become a rocket scientist? Question sieben. And this is our last question, and I like it quite a bit. And it say, it, the, the question is, what do rocket scientists say in place of it's not rocket science? The answer to that is, oh wait, it is rocket science. With that, we are a little bit uh, self-conscious, but we are having fun at our own expense. With that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention to uh, my seven questions to the rocket scientist. And if you enjoyed these questions and these answers to these questions, I'd like to encourage you to come and visit any aerospace, any uh, spacecraft museum in your area here in Seattle. We've got the Seattle Museum of Flight that uh, will allow you to explore more of the things that we talked about. I thank you for watching and if you enjoyed it, please join us again on this channel and we may want to do another one uh, in the near future.